Hi, uh, welcome all. Uh, thank you, Burillo, for giving me the opportunity to do this. I uh, absolutely agree with Franklin, uh, Dennis, and Murillo that this is one of the very nice features, and I think it's very unique to the FMA, and I think we need to be given a lot of credit for doing this. Uh, before I talk about the area that I'm sort of currently most excited about, and uh, uh, the world is somewhat paralyzed with, uh, let me, I, I thought I'd just mention a few words about research in general. Uh, so I, I, I tend not to give anyone advice on how to do research. Uh, I find that, I, I find it very odd to do that. So I thought instead I should just tell you how I do it and you can take your call as to whether you want to do it that way or not. I think there are different models and different people approach things very differently. Um, so uh, my research, I would say, has by and large been accidental. I don't have a big theme or agenda in my life that this is the ideology I want the world to follow, or these are the questions like, this is the impact I want to leave the world with. I have no such uh, ambitions. Uh, I'm only interested in learning the world, the markets, the economies, the institutions around me. Sometimes I find something interesting to say. It gets published. Other people like it. Uh, well and good. Usually I'm happy if it helps me understand what's going on around me. Um, so this was also how I wrote my dissertation. Uh, I'd actually changed something like four or five topics, like changing every three months from one to the other. I couldn't really get down to one topic, but then the long-term capital management crisis happened in fall of 98. I got very interested in it. Every day I used to cut out from newspapers some articles about it. I had a thick four-month four, four month collection of various things that were written on it. And at the end of it, uh, I had an idea for my dissertation. So it, it's in this sense that I, I was sort of saying that my research has been very accidental. Uh, it's usually based on trying to understand something that's going around. Uh, occasionally, it's, it's sort of derivative of some things other people have done. Maybe I, I feel I have something to say there, etc. Uh, one thing I... Uh, I try to do is, uh, uh, is it, it, for, for me personally, it's been very important to feel that at least in some grand scheme of things, what I'm doing has some relevance for what's going on in the markets and the economies at large. I think this is not essential. Uh, there's a lot of scope for very foundational and sort of providing micro foundations for finance and other things in economics. But as I said, I'm just sort of sharing uh, why I, uh, how I approached it. Uh, and why do I value that? I value that personally because I find that as time goes by, uh, in the academic profession, uh, you know, everything we do is, and everything is assessed based on what other people think of you. It's like, how many citations do you have to your papers? Did you get this award? Did you get called for the seminar, this presentation, etc. Uh, and I find it a bit too close and a bit too unnerving at times. So I find that if at the end of the day I can walk back and have some independent assessment of what I've done, uh, it, it, it sort of keeps my mind a little sane uh, in, in the profession. So uh, everyone has uh, something of this thing of their own. I think you need to have some independent assessment of your own research. I think you have to be excited about it. Uh, you have to have a clear idea of why you think it is important. Uh, and I think as long as you have that, I think many other things will follow. Or sometimes, <coughs> even if they don't follow, you will still have your own confidence in the papers and the research that you are doing on uh, The last thing I wanted to say, and this is somewhat controversial, so I have to word it uh, sort of properly, is that at the early stage of your career, uh, I found it sort of very important to read the literature, uh, read it in a great amount of detail. This is a phase when you are just learning what is out there, you are learning tools, you are learning methods, you are learning how to, what, what, what great thinkers of the past have said, etc. Uh, but there is some risk that uh, sometimes if you tow the literature uh, too strongly, you actually end up doing things which are just that literature plus epsilon. Uh, and I think uh, as time goes by and as you have established your foundations and understanding of the, the core literature that is out there, uh, sometimes it's good to actually just 
try to just think out of the box altogether. Just sit out there, think about questions, think about how you would make sense of it uh, from first principles or in some different way than you have read in the past. And while you are doing that process, but before you start writing your paper, it's good sometimes to actually shut your mind from the literature to an extent. I think try to develop your own independent understanding and insight about what is the question that you are asking. But before you start writing the paper, do go and go back to the literature again to ensure that what you want to say is not something that has already been said. Uh, it's not something that someone else has just put out in the last one month. But I think this process is important because even if you spend three months doing this and it led to nothing, I think thinking independently on your own without constantly going back to the literature about an idea is I think very, very important. I think it's important so that you have formulated your own independent understanding of what's going on. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of just saying this for more down the road, which is that it's easier to come up with creative ideas if sometimes you think about questions rather than you think about what has been done in the literature. Now the two are interrelated as I, as I said, but you have to keep going back and forth, back and forth. Uh, between us. Okay, so with sort of those four or five thoughts on sort of my approach to research, and as I said, you should follow your own model, the model that works for you. Uh, so this is just one model that seems to have sort of worked out okay for me. Um, so uh, since about 2008, I've been interested in this issue of how financial sector and sovereign credit risk uh, interact. Uh, this is a presentation I just gave last week. I won't be able to go through all of it. Uh, it was at the, uh, as a, at a new sort of annual reviews, which are there in all sciences and other subjects, uh, which have been started in financial economics by Eddie Lowe and uh, Bob Merton. Uh, and actually, uh, the reason why I, I'm spending some time on that is because uh, I think these are excellent for PhD students. Uh, these annual reviews get scholars to write about a particular topic, state-of-the-art review of the literature, open questions, big questions, what's being done, what's not being done. Uh, and many times I think this, uh, some of them will surely be more effective for PhD students as they are embarking on their research and thinking about other big areas. Uh, because the scholars who have been asked to contribute are asked precisely to do this. Think about young scholars, PhD students in mind, and try to summarize this for them. Okay, so uh, let's go back to this. I just have one sentence motivation for this area. In, f uh, in finance and in economics, there are models of banking crises and there are models of sovereign crises. But historical evidence is that banking crises and sovereign crises are often very uh, tightly interlinked to each other. Not all the time, but many of very often they are actually uh, entwined with each other. Uh, so a lot of the research I've been doing, and I'll talk about three papers, and I'll talk only about my papers in the spirit of uh, what I was trying to tell you earlier, um, uh, is basically trying to see how we can make sense of this nexus. It's very complex. Uh, there are all kinds of effects going on, but I just wanted to give you an overview of the issues here. So, uh, one thing that happens when large banks fail, uh, or entire financial uh, uh, sector is going to collapse, is that it's simply not credible and consistent for regulators to say that they will let the entire financial sector collapse. Uh, it's easier to do this if it's happening piecemeal, institutions are failing one after the other. But if you're like at September 2008, when there were close to 10 large financial institutions in the world about to collapse, uh, it, it's, 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 it's simply not credible that the regulators won't step in and, and stand the collapses. Uh, now, at this point, when the collapse is stemmed, usually the short-term creditors of the financial sector and perhaps even some long-term creditors have to be backstopped. They have to be told that regardless of what is inside these financial institutions, what kind of assets they have, whether we can pay you or not, <coughs> that we will take care of you. Okay. There's some sort of a backstop. It may be 100%. All creditors might get backstopped. There may be some losses passed on the creditors. But usually it involves some transfer from the taxpayers to the creditors of the financial sector. And uh, popularly, these are called as bailouts. 
Now, depending upon, so this is the point where I think there is one important nexus that emerges between the financial sector and the sovereigns. Okay? Because if your sovereign is extremely healthy and has such a deep balance sheet that they can actually bail out the financial sector without, without even blinking. Uh, you know, they can write a check for 200 or 300 billion dollars without actually anyone in the market worrying about can the sovereign really afford to do this? Well and good. Uh, there won't be any deep implications. There may be political outrage about the bailouts, but there might not be deep financial implications of the bailouts for the sovereign in this case. But suppose you are a sovereign that doesn't have this flexibility that the banking sector is very large relative to the sovereigns. In case of Ireland, it was of the order of two to three times. In case of Iceland, it was of the order of 10 times. Uh, in some of the European countries, it was it's going to be as large as uh, their existing debts. Then, then you have a problem because on the one hand, you want to save your financial sector, but on the other hand, you already have a somewhat stretched balance sheet. And so in the process of trying to save the financial sector, the sovereign may have to sacrifice its credit worthiness. It may get downgraded, uh, it, 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 or, or it might even actually end up with a crisis uh, if there are further shocks down the road. So in case of Ireland, uh, which was one of the largest bailouts in end of September 2008, uh, as the, uh, let me jump a little bit ahead to this, uh, so uh, this is just a graph that shows this. So the red line is the borrowing cost of the Irish banks and the blue line is the borrowing cost of the Irish sovereign. Uh, and what you see here is that uh, at one point the bailout is announced, which is this point. And on that day, the borrowing costs of Ireland start skyrocketing upwards. Uh, and what's really happening is that the market recognized that the for the kind of package that Ireland government had put together for the bailout, that we cannot really assume that they are going to be able to make all these payments that they have taken on. They might issue debt now, but their overall debt has become riskier and the market started reflecting this credit risk. And, and there is an interesting phenomenon going on here, which is that until this bailout point, which is 30th September 2008, there's not that strong a correlation between the banking borrowing costs and the sovereign's borrowing costs. In a short period of about a week or two weeks, there's a negative correlation because the sovereign is stabilizing the financial sector through inflation. <coughs> High borrowing costs come down, but the sovereign is getting riskier. But within a week after that, it's almost like these two balance sheets have got merged. They are now strongly co-moving with each other. And this is what I, I, I was trying to highlight, that what you see from this very simple graphical illustration for one country, Ireland, is that a nexus emerged between the sovereign and the banking sectors in terms of their borrowing costs. You can see here they are very tightly co-moving, even though a gap develops here afterwards because the bailout is no longer <coughs> credible, they are still co-moving very tightly in the period after the bailout. And so we think that uh, sort of bailouts or uh, stemming the runs or collapse of the entire financial sector in cases where the bailout is very large or when the sovereign is very stretched to start with, maybe one important transmission channel through which the banking sector affects the sovereign. But importantly, this develops a nexus and whatever <coughs> happens to the health of the sovereign is implicitly also moving the banks up and down. Because if the bank, if the sovereign is not healthy, if it, it gets a macroeconomic shock, the banks are no longer going to be deemed healthy in the market either. Uh, and we explain uh, in our work that there may be two important channels through which this reverse feedback happens, how the sovereign then feeds back onto the banks. One, there may be direct collateral damage, which is that banks may be owning debt of the sovereign. Banks may themselves be owning a lot of government bonds and they might get hit. This is not much unlike to the kind of scenario we are concerned about at midnight today. Uh, suppose there is a default, a lot of government debt is used in secure borrowing markets, a lot of banks and financial firms are actively using the government bonds as collateral or even as direct holdings, 
what sort of damage will it be fall to on this? Now, what what may happen tonight, hopefully not, but if it happens, it's somewhat different than what I'm talking about, but that collateral damage channel is the same, that the default on sovereign debt is going to have a direct impact on the financial sector. But there might also be an indirect impact, which is that if, if the uh, banking sector is implicitly guaranteed by the sovereign, this sort of time inconsistency problem I was mentioning, that it's simply not credible that when they all fail together, there will be nothing provided to the creditors of the financial sector, then even these implicit guarantees and their worth is going to move in the market with the health of the sovereign. And so the bank's borrowing costs, which are partly subsidized because of the guarantee, nevertheless, as the strength of the guarantee moves, they are going to cause this fluctuation up and down. So, uh, so this is sort of one interesting area where, as I said, it was triggered by something that happened in fall of 2008. And when we looked at it, we realized that actually the literature really views banking sector and sovereign separately. Maybe this is not. Maybe there is something to say here. Maybe there is something important research to do here, because maybe these balance sheets get entangled, and all kinds of interesting things could be. Uh, so in the paper, we then talk about how to fund the bailouts. The government will have to raise taxes down the road. The anticipation of taxes will cause the corporate sector to start underinvesting. And now you have another problem in the economy, which is that by trying to support your sovereign, you're actually crowding out investments from the healthier parts of the, of the economy. Okay. So then as we were exploring this, we got into the second question I wanted to talk about, which is, uh, and the next two things I want to talk about are both about this, and uh, I, I sort of wrote a paper on each while trying to answer these questions, which is, what is it, why is it that banks hold significant quantities of sovereign debt? Why do they do it in good times? Why do they continue to do this even when the sovereign debt is getting riskier? Okay, so the, uh, as this Ireland episode uh, evolved, <coughs> Then problems came out in Greece, Italy, Spain, and the Eurozone crisis gradually unraveled. And the reason why that crisis became so pernicious, uh, many commentators would argue that it is because there was a nexus between the financial sector and the sovereigns. That it wasn't just that the sovereign debt was held by big sovereign wealth funds and pension funds in other parts of the world. The banks in the Eurozone were themselves deeply entangled with sovereign debt holdings uh, of, of, of these troubled countries. So we look at this from two sides, okay? And it's, it's all related to this first point that I just mentioned, that very often uh, the banking sector gets into trouble, then the sovereign has to provide these guarantees. So we have to look at it from both sides, which is one, why is the uh, banking sector in such a scenario ending up with bond holdings of the sovereign? Uh, and two, might the sovereign also have incentives to have the banking sector be holding its debt? Okay. So these are the two questions I'm going to ask. So it's sort of like an equilibrium question, whether it's a convenient marriage for the financial sector and the governments to have this scenario where the financial sector is owning a lot of debt of the sovereign, and the sovereign is happy that the financial sector is owning a lot of this debt, even though there is this nexus and the fragility that comes with it, that the two of them have become deeply entwined. So uh, we use some empirical data, which was released uh, in Europe from 2010 to 2012, uh, and it's increasingly been released every time the European regulators do stress tests. And we tried to examine whether the reason why the sovereign, so there are two things. One, there are, as I said, there are times, the sovereign debt is always there on financial firms. Some of it is there simply because it's used to do, get money from the central bank. It's the collateral that is tendered to the central bank. It is used in the repo markets to do your overnight borrowings, etc. So there is some convenience associated with having government bonds. But what we found was that as the Italian, Spanish, Greek, Irish debt was getting riskier, uh, many banks in the Eurozone, and not just the banks of these countries themselves, but even French and German banks, were actually increasing their exposures to the sovereigns. 
Okay, so it almost looked like something like a doubling up sort of strategy that as these sovereigns are getting riskier, banks are loading up even more on the debt of these countries. Now, there's a very simple idea in financial intermediation that if you have an undercapitalized financial firm, which is that if you have a financial firm which is primarily funded with leverage and has very little equity cushion left, the shareholders will want to gamble for resurrection. Okay, now this is an idea that hasn't found much direct support in the corporate finance literature, but my view is that it's quite prevalent in the intermediation literature, partly because the, uh, in case of banks, there is this problem that if they fail, the creditors don't bear the costs. And if creditors don't bear the costs, they are not going to put the checks and balances to keep the shareholders from, from gambling and taking on these risky incentives. So the idea is equity is wiped out more or less anyways. Why not just do a big gamble? If it pays off, the shareholders will gain in a very big way. If it doesn't, we have very little to lose in the first place. And, and what we found is that it was primarily the undercapitalized banks uh, that took on uh, the riskier exposures uh, and essentially it looked like what has been called in the foreign exchange markets as a carry trade, which is that your short term creditors are not concerned about your risks. They are expecting to be bailed out. So they are giving you money at very low costs. Banks go and buy sovereign debt of troubled countries with this. It's trading at very wide spread because Spain, Italy, etc. have got into trouble now. And then uh, you hope that it pays off. Spain and Italy recover or they start looking like Germany within two or three years time. Uh, and if that happens, you would have made a huge gain on this trade because you bought the bonds cheap, they'd become risky, but then the prices would appreciate and you, you could fund them at very low cost. There are all kinds of regulatory things which make this possible. Banks are of course asked to hold capital requirements, but there's no capital requirements within the Eurozone for holding government bonds. So, you know, this creates a big, a big attraction because you can do these things without actually having to recapitalize yourself. Second, the central banks generally accept government bonds as collateral. The European Central Bank has been accepting this as collateral, which, all, which only sort of further entrenches these kinds of incentives. So, uh, how is this part of the overall research trend? The question to ask is why were these banks undercapitalized? These banks were undercapitalized because in fall of 2008, when they failed, the European solution was to bail out banks, provide guarantees, rather than recapitalize the banks. Okay? So they fixed the immediate problem of stabilizing the creditors, but they didn't restore the incentives of the bankers. Okay? Because the bankers were still working on very, very tiny cushions. And so they still had perverse incentives, and they chose to get entangled with this so-called debt. Okay, and that leads to the third question then, which is, okay, so, so, okay, banks got entangled, they made the mistake in fall of 2008, they left the banking sector undercapitalized, but then when things got into trouble, why did they not at least recapitalize the banking system then? Okay, they went in 2009, they went in 2010, 2011, but they have left the banking sector very fragile, okay, and so, we tried, I tried to understand this issue in the third paper, partly theoretically and partly empirically. And the simple explanation is the following, which is that suppose you have a government that is myopic, it's short term. Okay? It just wants to tide over until the next election or, or maybe it's even sort of every year when you renew your contract with your coalition, etc then you are not too interested in whether all this entanglement with the financial sector is going to lead to some deep banking problems, deep cuts to the growth of the economy down the road. What you want to do is to avoid a banking crisis at all costs in the short run and keep continuing to borrow in the market. So say you are a French government, you have a very high rating, you know your banking sector is in trouble, you should be recapitalizing it. But if I have to recapitalize and also maintain my credit rating, I'll have to cut back on some of my expenditures. Okay? Because I have to put some money into my banks, that money has to come somewhere else. Either I give up my rating or I'll have to sacrifice some of my expenditures in the economy. So what we show is that if uh, theoretically that if you have a if you have if you had some myopia to the government objective function, that they are just trying to survive from year to year or from election to election that they might actually have incentives 
to keep the banking sector undercapitalized because they know that if the banking sector is in trouble, they love to buy our debt. Okay, so the external creditors are not willing to fund this debt as much, but your banks are willing to do this because they are undercapitalized and they want to gamble on your debt. Now, of course, who's going to be paying for all this? It's going to be paid through in the form of a future crisis. It might lead to contraction of the economy, etc. But all these costs are being postponed to future periods. In fact, the, paradox, the irony of it is that it might be the same government in the future periods that might actually bear the crisis itself. But if its horizon is myopic, which is that it's simply trying to go from year to year, it's going to say, we'll worry about it next year when the problem happens. Right now, we just have to survive so that we can at least stay in power until the next uh, election comes due. So uh, without getting into details, I just wanted to uh, highlight this as an interesting research area. And I just wanted to explain the sequence of how uh, I went about with my co-authors thinking about this. As I said, it all started with this one graph that we had put together in fall of 2008, and then we kept extending it. For a while, we thought this was obvious uh, that you know when you do bailouts, it damages the government. But we thought, what's there to say about it? But then as we reflected more on it, we realized that there are models of banking crisis, there are models of sovereign problems, but no one is actually looking at the nexus. And that maybe at least in the last four or five years, most interesting things that are going on in the world have all to do with how we had a big financial crisis, but now in one way or the other, different countries are struggling with their fiscal uh, situation in one way or the other. So to just summarize, uh, uh, I would say this is sort of uh, one way in which you could approach research. Uh, this is how I like to do it. Look at something interesting that's happening. Maybe we don't have a good way of thinking about it. Uh, and then as you explore it more and more, you come up with newer questions, uh, newer things remain to be explained. Uh, and then you start seeing how the various pieces are fitting together. That banks get into trouble, in this case, then the sovereign bailout, because they're undercapitalized, they want to keep buying sovereign bonds. But because they keep buying sovereign bonds, only if they're undercapitalized, the sovereign wants to leave them undercapitalized uh, in the first place, and so on. Uh, so uh, let me stop here, and uh, uh, if, you, if there's have any questions, I didn't, uh, question. sorry, I should have offered you. Um, so um, I found what you are talking about very interesting. Uh, however, I have to admit, I have not really a paper yet. So I wonder, in order to do empirical work uh, in this area, what kind of data is required? Yeah, so it's not that easy to do empirical work in the area. Uh, there are some large uh, data sets called Bankscope and Worldscope, which have uh, ba annual balance sheets of banks with some data on how much government holdings they have, domestic as well as foreign. Uh, I would say with the state of the art in corporate finance and intermediation research, uh, you know, we need to identify the causal impact of X on Y. Uh, sometimes it gets a little hard to work with uh, annual data of this type. Uh, my own recommendation would be, if the question is interesting, try to look at it anyways. Uh, sometimes you can identify exactly the channel you want to uh, unearned sometimes it's not possible, but descriptive or clever tests of other type can also be useful in this regard. In case of Europe, there are other databases. There's a data set called Eurostat, which has a lot of data uh, on European sovereigns and financial firms. The Bank for International Settlements has some country level data as well. Uh, but one thing that is becoming most useful at a slightly higher frequency than annual, sometimes quarterly or sometimes semi annual, is that. The regulators are doing six monthly stress tests of banks and uh, they are providing information, uh, disclosures at the end of it of what is it that's on the bank balance sheets. And I found that data to be the most granular because they actually tell you which country's bonds uh, are these banks holding country by country. And then you have at least two, two snapshots a year. So it requires a little bit of, uh, I would say, putting together data from different sources. And I think that's one reason why maybe this area is not exploded yet, even though we've been seeing all these issues over the last five years. I would, I'm still a bit surprised as to how little work 
that is going on in the last five years uh, in this area. I, I would have expected more people to be working on sovereign credit risk uh, than we have at least in finance right now. So in that sense, it's still a hot area in my view. Yes. Uh, just want to raise a point. I think another perspective looking at the financial sector is No, I think these are all great points. So, uh, so there's a little bit of these things when you go into the details of our paper. There are external creditors, internal creditors. Uh, you are trying to actually entangle your domestic financial sector precisely because you are trying to build commitment to the foreign <coughs> creditors. That, Listen, I'm not going to walk away. Like, why is China still holding the U.S. debt? I think it's because they feel that uh, you know. They have to worry uh, that the U.S. has to worry about the big damage to its own financial sector from a default. The repo market is going to get disrupted. So they're all highlighting this cost. But I think this says that in some ways the entanglement is a form of commitment to the external creditors that they said, I'm not just going to walk away from your debt whenever I think it is convenient and strategically advantageous to do so. So but I think these are good points. In fact, just yesterday I was talking to a visiting uh, PhD student from Germany and the issue of capital flows you mentioned exactly came in, which is that maybe it will be very nice to have models in which banking crisis, sovereign crisis and capital flows are sort of jointly analyzed and maybe then you have something to say about the FX market, exchange rates, uh, depreciations, devaluations. There are some models, especially of banking crisis and currency crises, which are already out there, the general called twin crises. But I think the new angle would be to bring the sovereign in, so that you also study its balance sheet. Uh, so I think there would be a great research topic. What do you think tomorrow looks like if they default tonight? I think FMA is still going. Let me this question ask you. I was going to ask something. So, where do you go uh, when you make it, you know, a positive uh, inference? Uh, where do you go to make your positive recommendations in your papers? How far do you go? How far do you feel comfortable with making actual policy recommendations? Uh, How do you deal with that? Yeah, I usually go uh, very far, uh, <laughs> and then the referees uh, sort of pull me back saying, oh, this claim is not uh, justified, it's unwarranted. Uh, if, 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 if someone is very nasty, let's say, you know, he's really shooting off his head. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I uh, I think it's, it's, it's good to try to draw some policy conclusion in my view, uh, but I think uh, I was being facetious, but yeah, to the extent possible, they should be tied very tightly to your research. Uh, uh, I usually think it is easier to do it in the, in the, in the conclusion section or maybe have a separate policy section uh, in, towards the end of the paper. Uh, but you know, the times are such in financial intermediation research that like 10 years back when I was working on systemic risk issues, 
it was very hard to get someone interested in regulation of banks. Like if I spoke about something about Basel capital requirements and how they might be affecting banks, the usual referee report was, oh, this is like some institutional detail, it's going to change in two years time. Uh, it really, this is really not the kind of stuff we should be putting into the journal. But that's not true anymore. I think uh, the crisis has done one good thing, which is that I think fi finance and financial economics in some sense has become much more important in economics, especially in the area of financial institutions <coughs> since the crisis. Uh, but I think the policy issues, the public policy <coughs> issues, the specific regulation issues, the financial sector reform issues, uh, I think they are now almost on the center stage, I think, of a lot of research. Maybe almost, there's perhaps even an over-explosion in some ways of research in this area. But I think right now, policy motivation for your research is actually not a bad thing. I think it has become a good thing since the crisis. 